Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending my thesis defense. Feel free to take refreshments whenever you you like to have it. Today, I'm going to talk about Sensor Data Streams correlation platform for asthma management. I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Amit Sheth, for giving me the opportunity to present, and the rest of my committee members, Dr. Kalra, Dr. Prasad. Dr. Valerie Shalin. Dr. Kalga is from Data Children's. He's a pediatrician and also a clinical collaborator for K-Help for Asthma. K-Help for Asthma involves a lot of IoT devices and we use uh, extensively. Speaking of which, IoT devices, what are IoT devices? Um, they are basically a network of physical objects which has embedded sensors or softwares that communicate data over the internet through the smartphone. These have been widely used in many different sectors and industries. One such sector is the healthcare sector, wherein IoT devices greatly are majorly used. Some applications include fall detection, identifying anomalies in heart rate functioning, and also monitoring sleep stages. Asthma, a high burden chronic disease, is, is caused by airway obstruction in the lungs and it's a major cause of hospitalization in the United States. The Center of Disease Control reports that 27,739 children have been hospitalized in, in the year 2014. It is one of the poorly controlled and managed diseases because of its multifactorial nature. Multifactorial meaning that multiple different factors could impact and trigger symptoms. Symptoms can be coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and so on. Asthma triggers can be environmental variations, such as change in temperature, increased humidity, and so on. And then pollutants in the air can also impact these, these, uh, these asthmatic outcomes, such as dust particles. Genetical reasons can also be one of the factors. Each patient reacts differently to this. Some patients might be sensitive to poor air quality, and some <coughs> patients might be sensitive to pollen count. Vulnerability and severity levels also comes into the picture, wherein lower sensitive, lower uh, unhealthy groups can also affect asthmatic outcomes to the patients. For this reason, it is very difficult to diagnose with the kind of existing methods that are in the traditional model. Reviewing one of the one of the patients who is just going for a clinical visit, here's what happens. He is being examined followed by his history being reviewed. And then the physician would check his disease progression and the current symptoms he is experiencing, followed by an estimation of his health status to provide and devise appropriate treatment plans. Now, this particular workflow has several drawbacks, such as the, the, visit, the clinical visit that the patient is having is episodic, meaning that it could last for several months or the patient might not even go. This is a problem because the patient might forget to report what kind of symptoms they faced and also the medications that they, they, they use since the last visit. This is important to the clinician because the, he needs to track the disease progression and adjust his care plan. Other drawbacks include some of the data parameters which are, not, which are important to the clinician and are not available to the clinician, such as the patient's environment, the air quality and the environmental conditions could be useful to the clinician if given continue, on a continuous basis. To overcome these drawbacks, we have the Vision Augmented Personalized Health, which basically uses IoT devices and collect heterogeneous data to achieve these health strategies which are devised to make a transformation in the healthcare. These health strategies are self-monitoring, self-appraisal, self-management, intervention, disease progression and tracking. Self-monitoring is basically when the patients monitor themselves using the observations which are made by the IoT devices and make appropriate measures for themselves. Self-appraisal is something that the observations themselves and what does it mean with, with respect to the context of the patient and his disease. Self-management are nothing but alerts received to the patient and what kind of management strategies he would devise for himself. Intervention and disease progression are something that, are, that wherein the doctors would involve and they would intervene in order to provide and adjust the action plans for the patients to avoid triggers or maybe take their medication. 
Now there are several parameters which are deemed important and has to be collected by the IoT devices such as symptoms, patient environment and also medication usage. These, these are necessary and can be collected by the IoT devices, can be integrated together, could be summarized better for the clinician and, and answer his questions. What, what could be the contributed uh, what could be contributing the patient's symptoms and why did, did the patient even take the medication care for asthma is a semantic knowledge enabled platform wherein a k health kit is provided to asthmatic patients in order to analyze them and provide actionable insights k health kit consists of a smartphone device an indoor air quality monitor an activity and a sleep tracker and a peak flow meter which measures the lung functioning. This kit is provided to consented and recruited patients from Dayton Children's Hospital with the help of a clinical collaborator and an IRB approved study. This, this kit deployed for 50 completed patients has generated up to 2.5 million data points until now and it's a great challenge. Each, each deployment would last for one month trial period. This massive amount of data has created the following challenges. There are diverse set of parameters, which are, uh, which are again, the KHL kit collects up to like 29 set diverse parameters, which are necessary for the clinicians to analyze and find the triggering factors responsible for the asthmatic outcomes. Another uh, challenge is that there are higher sampling, sampling rates of each of the sensors included as part of the kit, which basically samples at a much higher rate compared to the patient reported symptoms. And these have to be synthesized together and harder when represented at the raw uh, format. So these are difficult to analyze very manually, even by any individual. Some of the prior studies which were done are these. We are mostly interested in kind of the objectives they are into, the sensor or the parameters they have gone, they have uh, used, and the patient trials done or not. We are concerned about the patient trials because we need real asthma patient study and uh, which would give us more uh, information about whether it's done or not and we could be comparing it with our study. The first study involves sensors being used um, to monitor patients and collect their V sounds <coughs> and then detect it whether it's an asthmatic, asthmatic V sounds or not. They have used spirometry, electronic stethoscope, a smartphone device, a sensor drone which monitors the patient environment, and oximeter for pulse ox oximeter. The second study is basically have, have developed a visualization tool which works along with health coaches in order to, uh, in aiming to reduce the information seeking time between the patient and the clinician. They have only included five participants who are not patients. They are mostly interested in activity and sleep stages of the participants. Third study serves as a warning system based on the outdoor environmental data that they collect and provides alerts to the individuals. The fourth study serves as an electronic diary wherein the patients can log in the symptoms, the medications that they have used, and also the peak flow readings. The fifth study tracks medication usage using an inhaler sensor based on the time and the location of the individual. While all of these some of these studies have used clinical collaborators in terms of acquiring the requirements for their system, they have no, they, they have no patient trials, nor did they have any direct clinical collaboration done. In summary, asthma being a multifactorial disease, uh, IoT sensors can enable to measure necessary factors responsible for triggering the asthmatic symptoms and could be beneficial in collecting data that's relevant for the clinician to diagnose. This massive amount of data just that's been generated by, generated by the K-Health kit could be leading to these challenges, is leading to these challenges such as diverse parameters, higher sampling rate of the sensors when compared to the patient recorded readings. Henceforth, my thesis statement is multi-model sensor data about activity sleep, indoor and outdoor environmental conditions along with patient reported symptoms and medication usage can be collected, analyzed 
visualized and summarized so as to enable correlating triggers with associated symptoms to obtain actionable insights. Just to give an outline of what I'm going to talk today, first I'll be talking about the kind of data sources I'm using and how each of these data sources are aggregated with separate strategies and how we query and process this information in order to provide to the visualization platform that we are delivering to the clinician which is useful. And then we take a quick recap of the overall system and then we... So go, go back uh, one slide. Okay. So you you would you'll be showing some examples of actionable insights, right? Yes. Coming back, uh, I'll be I'll be showing the system evaluation and how it's evaluated over usefulness and usability, <coughs> and then I conclude and speak about the future work. Data sources. We use the K Health Kit and the data and the and devices which are included as part of the KM kit and also we have developed outdoors, uh, outdoor environmental observations uh, to be procured with using the web services. The KHL kit consists of an Android tablet device which has an Android app which is built by our team. So this app prompts the patients with contextually relevant questions and captures uh, necessary information that's useful for the clinician in order to track the disease. Information such as symptoms and medication usage will be valuable to the clinician in order to track the disease and provide uh, necessary uh, plans, treatment plans. Over 16 parameters are collected per patient per day and uh, this, this is how the questionnaire looks like in the ad. For example, the patient might be using this app twice every day and once, once he takes the reading for his session, he might get this question, what kind of symptoms are, is he having right now? And he will, be prompt, he will be allowed to choose from one of the options that are given. A digital peak flow meter is also included as part of the K-Health Kit, which measures the lung functioning of the patients, <coughs> which would indicate if he is having any discomfort in breathing. This would also, many studies, many validated studies also recommend that symptoms reported by the patients, the medications, symptoms occurred to the patient, the medication usage is not alone important, but also the spirometry readings are important, the peak flow readings are also important in just uh, assessing the severity of the patient. <coughs> These are the two parameters which are measure, measured using the peak flow reading. There are about four data points which are collected per patient per, per day uh, using this device. We also use a variable uh, tracker which basically tracks activity and sleep. So there have been many validated studies which shows um, relevance between Fitbit derived activity and sleep versus the asthmatic outcomes. So, and they show associations between them. About eight different parameters are, cap are captured by this device per day per patient. Activity uh, related uh, parameters could be steps taken, uh, the distance covered, it can also be calories burnt, and also like sedentary or lightly active minutes. Sleep can be the sleep state, different sleep stages of, of the patient himself, like wearing the uh, wearable device while he's sleeping, and can be different duration. It is, it is a different duration during the sleep cycle. Patient's environment is also important and uh, I've told in the earlier slides that uh, environment can also, environmental variations could also trigger patient's outcomes. For this reason, we included the indoor air quality sensor uh, that is provided by this company, Fubot. We have several validated studies that investigated this and, and provided us insights uh, that this, these uh, these parameters could also contribute to the asthmatic symptoms that occur. Data collected by this is in a five minute interval of the day and it's highly, uh, highly, has a higher sampling rate when compared to patient reported symptoms. That is one of the challenges that we had discussed before. There are about 1,728 data points per day per patient collected for this. These are the parameters which are collected. It, 
it shows uh, it displays the air quality level whether it's good or bad based on the LED patterns that is given. Other LED patterns are mostly based on the device based functionalities. I think we need to recognize that far fewer number of uh, data points may be sufficient and that just having 1728 really doesn't add that much more. This is per day actually and, and it's... Uh, I understand, yeah. But you know, having, you know, if I had uh, sampled this at one tenth rate, may still be sufficiently good, right? I mean, just knowing it every five minutes or whatever is not necessary. Maybe knowing it every half an hour would have been good enough. Something, uh, you know, so, so just, you know, some of the data is not, all, all, not all the data has an equal value. Mm -hmm. And this is perfectly fine. It's not an issue that you need to necessarily address, but going forward, I mean, this, you know, significance of the data is something we need to think about. And just having a large number of raw data doesn't mean that it's, you know, adding so much more value. Since the environment is also one of the factors responsible for asthmatic um, symptoms, we also developed uh, web services which could collect outdoor environmental observations and these collect based on the monitoring stations that report the outdoor observations and also these are periodic for every hour of the day these services fetch these outdoor values and then store it in our data store. These collect from these national data sets such as environmental protection agencies AdNow, Poland.com and Weather Underground. The parameters collected are ozone, particulate matter, humidity, temperature and pollen count. There are about one or eight data points collected per patient per location. To summarize, the k kit consists of a tablet device which collects patient reported uh, parameters and then it also passively senses uh, from these sensors, Fubot, Fitbit, and also the peak flow. Peak flow is actively sensed. In total, there are about 1,852 data points collected per patient per day. And this is, uh, this is like huge. When compared to like a 30 day period, this could be huge. Considering a patient who is deployed for 30 day period and the kind of data representation right now that we get and it's given to the clinician, this is what we have. For Fitbit sleep and activities, we have about 240 data points in total. For indoor air quality, given that it samples at every 5 minute interval, it gives up to 51,840 data points. The questionnaire, which comprises of the symptoms, which captures symptoms and medication usage, collects up to 360 data points and 120 respectively. And the outdoor, it collects up to 2,940 data points. And in total for just the 30 day period, we have about 55,500 data points. And given this kind of a representation to a clinician, it's really hard to even understand what's going on. For this reason, we have this cloud infrastructure built to process this data and summarize it better in terms of visualization and then the clinician could gain insights. Discussing each of the data sources and how they are aggregated separately, we have this actively sensed readings from the tablet device and also the peak flow meter reading which the patient uh, looks at it and then records it through the smartphone device. It's stored to a cloud-based service which uh, called Firebase, which is also maintained by an administrator. We also procure the variable data through the Fitbit authentication enabled APIs, which require us to maintain a mapping inventory, which has all the device IDs and all the other details in order to map it with the patients that we have and then retrieve that particular data. The indoor air quality monitor collects data to his uh, to their own respective cloud, and then which is later retrieved by our services. The environmental web services are developed in order to in order to collect environmental data from these sources based on the monitoring stations and the observed value and the time. 
this is eventually stored into a cloud storage that we have. I'll discuss why, why we have chosen this later. But this is, uh, this, uh, we are doing all of this efficiently, model it perfect, in, so that we can query easily. And our querying part is less cumbersome. This also involves careful uh, defi definition of the schema itself. Now this is the cloud storage that we use. We use Elasticsearch, which is an Apache Lucene based uh, cloud storage. It is a NoSQL based database. It's, it's all about that. And these are the functionalities which we perform in order to retrieve the data better and to make the server side, uh, client side visualization look better by taking all the processing to the cloud. Solution for these challenges, diverse parameters, we have about 29 diverse parameters that we had discussed. We separately store them in tables with appropriate schema and these have like numeric geo schema and also time series to perform time series analysis we have the date things. Another uh, challenge is that we perform, another challenge and how we solve it is that we perform aggregations in order to just filter out as Dr. Shed had mentioned before in order to in order to just make uh, the clinician only filter out what he needs based on the intervals. It can be day, it can be a 12 hour period and however granular he wants. He can also apply statistical function, basic statistical functions such as min, max, and average on these on the observations that are available, and this could benefit him by by just checking either max is triggering the symptoms or min is triggering the symptoms for an average. Moving on to the queries, we make complex queries um, based on the deployment dates of the patients. We filter out uh, the environmental observations based on the time period at which the patient is deployed and also based on the location from which the patients are present. So we are, we are provided with the patient's zip code. Based on the zip code, we just geocode the zip code into an approximate coordinate and then query our data store to collect the observed value. So the question I have is uh, there are other systems we have built that do uh, querying of uh, data, uh, you know, complex queries against data. Um, I think in the uh, uh, Elasticsearch and uh, uh, systems uh, that uh, Twitteris uses uh, for, you know, statistical and visualization of the data. There is, is data stored in uh, Elasticsearch and that is being queried for, is it? Whatever, you know, this kind of queries. There, you could potentially add um, a number of statistical packages um, and visualize the results also. Why do we do it by implementing ourselves versus using some existing package on a particular data store? So uh, this particular part is is being done uh, by leveraging Elasticsearch functionalities. Okay. So these queries are actually functionalities of Elasticsearch Modify a little bit, like for example, the deployment period has to be given the input mm. fields. Sure. So that's that's the only thing we are mm. just plugging in the values. Okay. But again, the, apart from this, uh, we also use utility functions in order to just process the information that's retrieved from the Elasticsearch and then provide a neat information to the visualization platform. So. Would I need uh, to use uh, some R functionalities or mm -hmm. some SPSS or something else uh, rather than this one to get what we want? Mm -hmm. have, we, have we thought about that? Mm -hmm. We did and then only we started the dashboard right up today. So uh, first thing we could have used Tableau, Kibana or anything but it is not giving what we want actually. Okay. It's not personalized and uh, we, want, we will be in future including all the statistical functions that is needed. For example, going to the predictive analytics, analytics and everything to this dashboard. Okay. And uh, if we go, I mean, we have Excel sheets. We can just take the data and uh, see what's going on there. But we can compute all the possible uh, 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 statistical functions like cause and effect or correlation or whatsoever. But the thing is, this problem is different. Our problem is cause and effect problem. And we have 29 parameters. 
we have to boil it that down to the useful parameters, the significant parameters that we need in order to find the symptoms. As you said, all 1,772, pa sorry, 1,700 parameters might not be useful. So we have to see in what form if we aggregate that will be useful to see the symptoms and what parameters are actually correlating with the symptoms so that we can pick only those and then do, do our computations or whatever which is necessary. So in order to s visually see that, what is actually contributing, we, we obviously require a dashboard. Yeah, no, I, I, I think my question is not about the value of dashboard, it was more about computations, query processing that goes on underneath, and whether anything else existing. Uh, so the existing systems so far that we have now out there, the commercial products, it's not possible to do with it, and then we decided to okay. So to answer your question, um, so there are certain plugins that are also available mm -hmm. as part of Elasticsearch, which provides statistical operations and mm -hmm. functionalities, which could be leveraged mm -hmm. in the future. And uh, so, when you say which could be leveraged, do we know such a need, or this is just a broad statement? It's a broad statement, actually, mm -hmm. very generic. But basic functionalities are already provided, so we are just. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, going back to the patient recorded observations. So, those are the queries you have built in. That's just an example. Yes, yes, Doc. It's an example of one of the patients that we uh, query for. So, we base we basically uh, query based on the deployment dates, which is this one. The patient, uh, as a as a uh, name, the patients are are being identified. So, we give the uh, with query based on the patient and also the symptoms that we need. So 7 to 12 are basically the kinds of the options that are provided as part of the smartphone application that was discussed before. And these are the symptoms. And we also check whether the, they are having symptoms or not and then provide only the necessary ones. This is a little bit uh, tricky here. but. Moving forward, such complex queries are performed in order for the visualization to just have less processing on that side. So this is the visualization platform that is built, which summarizes uh, the necessary items from the data store that we have, such as the uh, short-acting short -acting medications used by the patient the number of missing days, because so we also have the uh, challenge of the compliance, the patient being compliant towards answering the questionnaire for the KL kit, and also the symptoms that are that have occurred for the patients. And quick demo. So this is the dashboard which is uh, hosted in a particular URL. So we have uh, quick summaries that could that clinician could get the short-acting medications used, the missing, which is this one, the number of symptoms. This is for one of the patients in our trial. You can also notice uh, these are all the outdoor environmental observations versus the symptoms the patients have uh, occurred, the, the patients face, and then the short-acting medications, which is basically these ones represented. So these uh, these observations are, are also color coded based on the severity severity groups, unhealthy groups. This group this information is retrieved from the respective sources and also reviewed by our clinical collaborator. Can you could you just give me a give me an example of how I'm supposed to read this? I'll be giving in the okay. Next. okay.
the, um, the panel on the side also shows the patient compliance and the contributing instances that were retrieved from these by applying threshold for each of the parameters that we have. So assuming that so one of the parameter reaches above 70, it will be configured in this particular panel and then we would see whether this, there has been any symptom or not and based on that, the chances of that particular parameter being the contributor will be calculated by this and then a probability will be shown. Another thing is the indoor air quality. For this particular patient, we also have compliance and in the indoor air quality uh, sensor not being used. And as you can see, uh, the upper half of the graph shows all the indoor air quality pollutants that uh, pollutant measurements that were measured by the indoor sensor, and the below shows the symptoms occurred versus the steps taken by the patient and also the sleep sleep stages and the duration. And based on this, you can also go more granular. So we can also make aggregations based on our. So for example, when we have an observed value of the environmental observation, we can put all the 24 values which are collected every hour of the day in one, one day and then we can aggregate it whether we want max or min or something like that. Dr. Kara, is there um, any um, heuristics as to when you would want patient to be monitored more frequently or more actively or um, um, eventually, for example, develop uh, some strategies to, let's say, when we are doing uh, self-management, uh, uh, or intervention where we could alert patient that uh, maybe it's good to uh, reach out to uh, uh, the clinic or something. So, uh, you know, we know that uh, there is this lag between a trigger and then uh -huh. the full manifestation of the disease. So if we are able to intervene in that window period, there's going to be more value from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, patient perspective outcome as well as, you know, the societal cost, public health impact. So uh, following up on the comment you made about how much should we sample, if we could sample at you know, a reasonable interval and then adjust that as some parameters change. So let's say our peak flow uh, or FEV1 has changed or, you know, and we can define that it has to be a negative change uh, by 10% or 20% and then suddenly we are monitoring the patient closely and then build our alarms and triggers. So that would be more meaningful, uh, I think, if we are going to have this actively participate in managing the patient. Now, actually, here is some, some, the way I look at it. So in your response to that five minutes, the way I looked at it was that, suppose somebody is allergic to smoke. I don't know when my parent is smoking. And so continuous monitoring will allow me to catch those intervals. Mm -hmm. Or, for yes. example, uh, if you think about pollen count, so uh, spring, the daybreak, morning, maybe the pollen counts are much higher than uh, later in the evening. So either I wait and customize, or if it is cheap to collect this data, I just collect continuously, and then I kind of focus my attention, and hopefully it will show up in your, uh, these graphs that you have that the pollen peaked, and then subsequently with the time interval that we do not ha have a good knowledge of, uh, sometime a little later, we will find the symptom showing up. Yeah. And so all that would be possible by just using a standard approach like this to collect, and then later on, maybe we can refine uh, the time interval. What is the time constant of that time interval? Are we talking hours or are we talking days? <laughs> so it varies. Like yeah. he said, it's multifactorial. So some patients, you Could know, they go out on a hard day in a few hours are mm -hmm. wheezing and having the full symptoms. So we'll vary patient to patient and so we'll have to eventually figure out how to customize it to the patient. But uh, if your platform has the ability to have like a standard display mm -hmm. and then, you know, for the, uh, some, because if we know most families, the exposure to tobacco smoke happens as once they come home in the evening, the parents, or before they go to work in the morning, mm -hmm. 
then we know we have to monitor those as a standard. But then, you know, uh, yeah. when it's not fitting in, or if the clinician wants extra data because it's not uh, panning out, then you have the ability because the data is captured. For now, our much. cost is not, you know, of, of sampling uh, yeah, is it's not cheap. there. It's cheap, so yeah. it is, it's not a, itself not mm -hmm. creating an issue. Uh, and the cost will be only when you want a human to pay attention to anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so machine costs are minimal per se. Uh, you know, we are not paying for uh, you know getting more samples anyway. But uh, I think something to you know I'm more more interested is is when do you want to the example of uh, you know smoke second hand smoke kind of thing that that's interesting one that can be uh, changing that particular parameter be changing fast and coming down fast. Mm -hmm. uh, humidity is li likely to change uh, that fast in, in a room if the thing is always left in a bedroom. It's unlikely to change very fast. See, for example, pollen triggered wheezing that we have experienced, it's been something like six, six hours. So evening, the kid is exposed to pollen, and then the wheezing actually starts around midnight. So it could potentially change like that. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, just a quick recap about the overall system and what's really happening. So we have this uh, cloud infrastructure that's built in order to retrieve data from different sources. Patients who are using the K-Health kit would record readings using the smartphone device, the indoor air quality monitoring device, Fitbit, and Peakflow. The, the, the parameters which are recorded by the smartphone are updated in real time uh, to the services that we have. So, which is provided, the service is provided by Google's Firebase. Now, the reason why, uh, the reason why uh, we had issues in the past is because uh, patients had Wi-Fi connectivity issues and the data might, might not be even collected. So, for this reason, we included Google's Firebase, which has caching and temporary storage kind of technologies and functionalities, which are being leveraged here. The sensor data that's been recorded by the patients is captured to the respective uh, vendor clouds and these are retrieved to our services later. We also periodically collect outdoor environmental observations which was discussed before and that's our thing. Eventually to this spit out everything to the visualization platform that we have. Considering a patient scenario uh, from one of our trials, we have this uh, uh, patient who has been recording their readings using the K-Health kit. So we have the symptoms that the patient has recorded using the tablet device and it came up to the dashboard. And also the patient has been using the medication over here. These, um, going more in detail and why I have split, why the series has been split is because to avoid clutterness. So we have the humidity and temperature being displayed here and the ozone and other parameters displayed above. So how do we go about this? What kind of questions do we get while seeing this data? What kind of questions does the clinician would get first? He might be interested to know what are all things that contributed to the patient's symptoms. Why did the patient even take the shot or the medication? I was told that the clinician is mostly involved, mostly interested in the rescue medication inhaled usage because they might take it in when, whenever they need a quick relief. The color zones, as I mentioned before, are based on the unhealthy regions. Question. Yes. So how come they did not use the inhaler when they had the symptoms? <laughs> After like two days they used it. No, there are two cases where the patient uses. Sometimes they just get the symptoms and if the symptoms is less intense, they may just uh, use it. And then sometimes if they feel some sort of chest tightness and think that, okay, they, I might get symptoms, they take the shot at the medication. So the two events that we are basically interested in is when the patient gets the symptoms and when they take the shot at the both occurs on the same day, it means that the patient has got the symptom, it has gone worse and then they have taken the shot at me. So. 
but also you know in the clinical situation just imagine that this is a child who had some cough and thought it's you know nothing much then they have figured out either the symptoms are getting worse or that they're going to go out and play the next day or do some physical activity and because the symptoms happened then they decided to be regular so there's several you know potential explanations of why this happened hey, so can we infer something about what is causing the symptom from what you have displayed so explaining that um, so the symptoms could have been caused because of combined factors such as humidity being uh, being more and also the ozone ozone levels of the thing and then as a result the patient would have fe felt that it's it has been severe and they would have started taking the medication so here is my reverse engineering the whole thing so for example if you look at the ozone right the second peak on the right is significantly higher so maybe that caused more uh, intense that affected more or something and that's how would you would rationalize the medic medication usage and and the lack of symptom because of the usage or yeah. yes, can yes, you build yes. some story of that sort yes the but the way we, uh, what i'm trying to say was because of higher thing uh, they would have taken the medication and they did not get the symptom because it's right yeah so that's how i would right. try to rationalize yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'll leave it to the more qualified <laughs> clinician to shoot me down i guess <laughs> It, it, this, you know, the, this also gives us uh, some idea that even we, we need even more data than what we have. For example, it might help us uh, know, to know how many hours of outdoor activity. So, because some of this parameter, you know, particle matter is not affecting you when you're outside because you're only measuring, you know, mm -hmm. in your room, and whatever that is is not, you know, somehow affecting you. Uh, but. Uh, uh, can we infer that, like steps or something? Yeah, I showed in the demo, right? Yeah, I want to make sure that this person was deployed before 10th May, right? Yes. This is I mean, theoretically, this is we may want to uh, uh, develop a guess uh, based on uh, Fitbit. Has this yeah. person had um, a significant outdoor exposure or not? Yeah. You could guess, and 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 based on because the number of you know uh, in the in house you won't take as many steps. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, additionally, should we go with the IRB and uh, allow you know actual uh, location Logging. tracking? Then of course we'll have even more. Yeah. And uh, it can be. I mean, it may be justified. I don't know. We may want to do that. Mm -hmm. but right now we are not doing the location tracking. Mm -hmm. Just we wanted to keep uh, you know. Uh, we have less problem with the IRB approval, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think I don't think that um, we'll just have to come with a clear argument that location tracking will still not allow us to uh, know about the individual patients and they should be safe. Yeah, it's not that intrusive yeah. to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, In fact, uh, I think this. Suppose we move to, uh, right now we are, remember, doing these things primarily driven by tablet that we are giving them. Mm -hmm. But the moment we move this to, is, uh, uh, to, to smartphone, we'll immediately start, uh, you know, tapping into accelerometer, mm -hmm. and that will give us, uh, you know, pretty good activity. A lot of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think. And, um, you know, what happens when you are out, you, are, you put, you put uh, you know, smartphone in your, uh, you know, mm -hmm pocket and uh, yes. you know, take with you. So that will clearly identify what, you, what you're doing, whether you are mobile or indoor. And you're the same location or not. Even if you decide that we'll, uh, for example, we can uh, you know, say that by taking precise measure, we'll automatically transfer that into imprecise, uh, but just keep the delta, meaning yeah. the change of the location. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And not, you know, and then, then, then there is not much to go back to. So does Fitbit have GPS coordinates? No. Other models have. Some models have, uh, the one that we are using does not have, but other models, some models also have. And you've reached out to the manufacturer? Because it may not be commercially acknowledged, and maybe in a beta testing or something. No, no, you can buy those. No, no. Yeah. You can buy those available. Yeah. Uh, we just have to pay $50 more for uh, GPS right. tracker. But y y you can also, when I, this Fitbit that I have, um, 
I can uh, you know track it using the mm -hmm. in so it, if I turn on the application Fitbit, then I would know precisely where I am. And that time the GPS by the phone is accurate, so you can get that if you want to. So we were able to uh, evaluate the system based on usefulness and usability. We included five researchers and five healthcare providers in the study. By providing a questionnaire survey, it was developed uh, with relevance to the asthma. And this was given first uh, with the tabular data that we had collected using the KF kit, which is this, and then the questionnaire that we had developed. And then we gave the platform, which is then followed by the same questionnaire, and to check whether there is a comparative difference between using the tool versus not using the tool is being see. So we measured usefulness and, and the overall usability was measured using system usability scale which was uh, found by John Brook in 1986 and this is a standard uh, scale that is provided. These are the relevant questions which were uh, prompted to the participants. They would they would see the uh, tabular data that, we, that they have, which has the K-Health readings as well as the other observations, and then use the dashboard to answer the same set of questions. Responses that we got had these differences. So the y-axis shows a Likert scale of all the responses that they gave for each of the questionnaire that was developed. As you can see, um, moving on to the previous slide, so the question here has five sub-questions. So in total, they have seven. So the y-axis has uh, seven sub-questions containing each of the responses with and without the tool, showing a difference between the usability and uh, usefulness of the tool. We had about like uh, five respondents, each of which are given two patient data, meaning that they will have two sessions, two block of questionnaire, without the tool, with the tool, without the tool, and with the tool, without the, or two different patients. Who are those respondents? What is the characteristics of those? So these respondents were uh, the from the clinical, uh, from Dane Children's Hospital. Contemptors. How would you guys say that? So they were, uh, you know, two allergists, um, two asthma nurse practitioners, and one asthma physician, oh, wow. pulmonologist. That's great. We left out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the significance testing that we had performed. You want the system usability scale? So this basically uh, evaluates the system uh, for its usability by providing 10 set of predefined questions to uh, participants. These participants can be anyone. And they have benchmarked this and uh, found the average is 68 among 500 studies already. But this, is, uh, this should not be uh, confused with percentage because 68 is the 50th percentile among mm -hmm. the 500 studies that have been done. And the source says that uh, if any user interface is above 68, it is consider considered good. And these are our results for both healthcare providers and researchers who have answered mm -hmm. the questions. Moving on to conclusion in future work. So asthma being multifactorial and challenging problem, we were able to use the multi-model sources and we were able to collect the necessary things and explore for correlations. We provided an integrated approach for this and we provided a system which is much more scalable and uh, summarizes this trigger information better for the clinician in order for him to make actionable insights. As part of the future work, Um, anecdotes from the from the dashboard could be uh, gathered, cleaned, 
and based on this, uh, the clinicians would be able to make heuristic-based rules because he believes more, more in cause and effect associations than correlations which might be spurious. And thus, if verified, uh, if these evidences are verified with the clinician and then he, he feels confident about it, probably we could predict the occurrence of symptoms. Another approach is to feed all the patient reported symptoms, environmental observations and other observations to a machine learning classifier, train it and then predict the occurrence of symptoms as well. Thank you. So based on uh, you know what you've learned through this project, uh, would you, uh, if you were to do it again, change the questionnaires? Yes. Or add uh, more things? Yes. So some of the, one of the challenges that we are facing right now is the complexity at which the questionnaires are prompted to the patients. So right now what we are trying to do is refine this questionnaire, make the user interface also better for the patients to just see and answer what they are required to do. And then this would capture relevant parameters needed for the clinician. You are saying about complexity of the question or the way the questions are asked? I would redo the questionnaire. So no, the nature of the question. Nature of the question this is for the patients, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or would you want more information, you know, because you've sort of realized the limitation of the data that was fed to you in trying to do inferences? Would you have liked more information? Actually, it depends. Like, if, if I have more, uh, in terms of computation, there is no problem. We just go ahead and feed it. We have a lot of technologies. But in terms of requirements needed by the clinician, we need to filter out what he needs. So more information might be causing problems to the end users. So I feel that less information is good. More information in terms of computation is not a problem. No, I, I think let, let me respond in a slightly different way. So, so essentially, I think it would have been nicer if we knew exactly when the symptom appeared in relation to when you took the medication. Mm -hmm. For example, right now, right, we give answers at a fixed time of the day and night. And we do, we lose a time stamp of when did you have cough or when did you have wheezing. So if we had that information, it would have been better uh, for so an we asked mm -hmm. did you have uh, a symptom in the last 12 hours but yeah, then we don't follow and say it was at what yeah, time yeah, yeah, right? yeah. if it yeah. were closer it would have been nicer yes. and and again having continuous monitoring let's say of wheezing would probably provide us that information and make it non invasive so i was actually referring to the complexity in that particular way so mm -hmm. i didn't i was not clear so i'm just a human factors person all right doctor but from a human factors perspective, <coughs> it still looks like there's a pretty big burden on the clinician to do the interpretation. And so, you know, I really, I really like that second bullet that you had there, what can we do with machine learning? And my question is technical. Do I need to worry <coughs> about the time series nature of the, of the data and doing, when, especially when I don't know lag, do, do I have a, a complexity problem in developing a machine learning model with time series data or not? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I mean here, here is my global problem. So if, if you give me a, a bunch of spreadsheets, right, and then we can write all kinds of fancy programs, but what kind of hypothesis would I like to verify? And to me, your K health dash is basically enabling me to do that. So I have a bunch of data sitting there. I have I know how to programmatically process it, but it's some kind of a blind search. And so now I want to use your KHL dash to come up with a meaningful hypothesis that I can mm. use to verify. To me, that is the role that, that your uh, thing is playing. And will that take care of the complexity issues then if I go in with a top-down hypothesis about what I'm doing? At least it gives me, uh, it allows me to narrow down the yeah. search of hypothesis. Yeah. Right? See, evaluation, for evolution, we can do it on raw data, on in spreadsheet mm -hmm. and all that, and we can apply any, any, any you know, much more sophisticated, more sophisticated techniques. But what the hypothesis is, you yeah. know, so from all these things, that is where this visual inspection gives you an idea of yeah. possible hypothesis we can validate on the data, and that is the value primarily mm -hmm. right now. <coughs> in terms of the 
think about complexity of the questions, I think more <coughs> given that compliance, meaning once system has been working well, you are able to, people are answering the questions, right? <coughs> I don't think that that by itself has been a big problem. Okay. Yeah, it may have been <coughs> not most, um, um, I mean, pe people may not have feel, felt very comfortable with the questions we asked, but then that has not deterred them from giving us the answers. So I think, uh, you know, something that may help you is, and for students who are going to design projects like that, if we would have approached this a little differently, uh, where we give you some information, patient A is an asthmatic whose symptoms only act in spring and fall, year round, so you deploy the tablet at the right time, mm -hmm. unless you're monitoring the whole year. Mm -hmm. Then we split them into the categories of allergic and non-allergic, so you know which parameters to focus on because with your mission, you know, in predicting asthma symptoms, you will sort of pretty much have your algorithms geared towards what, uh, you know, is important for that patient. We could also get some sense of established patients about, you know, what their perceptions is. If somebody is known not to be compliant uh, with A, taking medication or so, you know, you may want to factor that in in their responses. Uh, oh, there are patients like that. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you noted, I think this is, you know, design next time. This, these are clear things we could do. Um, clearly, I think the first, my, my view is that the first experiment had to be done in a more generic way without mm -hmm. being, right. you know, right. because yeah. otherwise you would say you are biasing and all that. Right. Having done what we have done and after 100 patients, I think next time if you do, we can argue that there is a more, you know, we'll, we'll, the data we can gather will be more effective, more targeted to get, you know, more personalized solution for different classes of patients, types of patients. And, you know, so, you know, I think we can design the experiment better with less effect, uh, effort that we have to put in. Um, now, of course, we are trying to change the equation in terms of the ease of collecting the data or cost of collecting data. That's where, um, uh, you know, our current emphasis on chatbot is coming in, where we hope that, uh, you know, in a few months we'll have uh, an alternative to this where um, uh, this data can be collected on a smartphone, which is with you all the time, and they can be collected by uh, both uh, uh, a text-based as well as voice-based chatbot. So they can record it whenever they want uh, and not be reliant on, you know, using this application twice a day. And so that will be available to them anytime they have a smartphone. And it could be cross-platform. That means they can continue to use Tablet if they want, but they, they can take uh, uh, Google Home Mini or they can use, uh, uh, you know, a smartphone. Any one of them can allow them to collect the data. It doesn't matter which device we use to collect the data, we'll collect it. Any one of them, they'll all be aggregated and it's available to us. That will make it also, you know. <clears throat> and if and when we do predictive analysis, right, it is better to customize. For example, if one person is sensitive <coughs> to say smoke versus ragweed versus say spring season. <coughs> so I would like to monitor the things that you are vulnerable to in the period that such triggers exist, right? That's so, so if you are sensitive to spring allergy, then I will use the thing with spring allergy as the focus and then do predictive analysis and then warn you as to when you should take the short or long acting or be careful or close your doors or windows or whatever. So, so in that sense, we can customize, based, personalize the actual app to the things that matter to you. So that that would be helpful. So what right now we are doing is trying to gen, use a gen, generic app to determine what is the problem that that causes your allergy by going into your home environment and so on. So the next step is now that I know what is the problem, how do I help you? Like how do I give you actionable insights? And so in that case, I would like to customize it for your problems and then use it. You know, another potential project for students is to mine this data 
and then access data in the hospital records about all and those triggers and try and correlate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you know, yeah. this is very valuable that you are already collecting this data, and then it's being collected in parallel in the doctors' mm -hmm. offices and hospitals. So we could sort of use mm -hmm. correlation. In fact, we also want to see whether the digital monitoring correlates with your labels like severe, mild, and uh, do, and you, all do that we need to stuff. get uh, some fellow or student on your side, or can we uh, tra uh, essentially take one of our students through uh, whatever process necessary to give them the access? Uh, because they, they have done the city courses and such. So, yeah. I mean, do we need to do anything more? Yeah. Maybe hospital has some. Yeah. Uh, whatever, whenever students come to the hospital, you take them through some training, right, That's about right, data yeah. privacy and yeah. all that. But one of them will be, can we can do that. So I think the best thing would be if we can pair, because yes. there are residents who yes. are in training for pediatrics <coughs> and medical students who have an interest. Um, and if they can pair with one of the graduate or postgraduate students. So we had one student, right? Uh, was it? From your side, Asara was no. Simi. No, no, Simi. Simi. Yeah, yeah. So Simi was there, and then uh, in Bayatric we have Sara. So yes, indeed, the, I think, and that can be done as part of our current project, right? I mean, right. we will get more done with the same data, uh, and, and have better results. Yeah, because one of the limitations in getting information to you was that we were waiting for approvals. Now mm. they are in place. Mm. Great. Yeah, and in fact, we are going to add the BMI thing, right? To this. Okay, great. Any other questions for the audience?